recording just to make sure that anyone who isn't able to join us uh, this evening can um, still watch it, watch us back. Um, and um, so good evening, everyone. Um, a very, very warm welcome to everyone for joining us for this talk. Um, this is part of a series of regular online talks uh, over this academic year. Uh, we're really glad to have attendees, um, as the chat is proving, from across the world, and your support means so much to us, so thank you. And several attendees uh, this evening are Holocaust survivors and refugees and their family members, so an especially warm welcome to them. Uh, my name's Alex, I'm the Visitor Operations Manager for the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Centre, um, run by the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association. I'm here to facilitate the tech side of things, and I'll be monitoring the chat as well, so do flag any tech issues or anything in there, I'll do my best to help. And we'll use the chat function for questions at the end. Um, so although everyone's on, everyone will be on mute for the talk, you are very welcome to interact in the chat and uh, do send any questions through for either of our speakers or both. Uh, I'm going to just say a little bit about us by way of an introduction, and then I'm going to hand over to co-director Dr. Chelsea Sandbells, who will be facilitating the conversation between our two speakers this evening. So we are recording this talk and tomorrow I'll uh, be sending out the link to access the recording and the link to just a short general online survey. It's just about sort of how you found us um, yeah. and what we normally do online. We're not Big Brother, but we just want to know how people find us and how we can get the word out about what we do to more people. And we want to make these events the best they can be. You can always pop us an email if you've got specific feedback about this event as well. So a little bit about us. Um, the... Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association um, and their centre, the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association started in the 1990s. It's because of a remarkable group of people who all um, are based in the north of England, who formed the association and shared their experiences of being refugees from and survivors of the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, um, some of them for the very first time uh, later in their lives. And they've been supporting each other in friendship ever since and often involving their families too. Um, some of them began speaking out about their experiences uh, to educate others about what the effects the intolerance of others can have and what it can lead to. Um, the Holocaust Exhibition and Learning Centre, based at the University of Huddersfield, opened in September, September, September 2018. Um, and it's part of their legacy of teaching the lessons of the Holocaust to others, uh, particularly as those who were eyewitnesses diminish in number. Uh, the exhibition, although it tells the full story of the Holocaust, focuses on the stories of 16 individuals who made their lives in the north of England, people who became active members of our communities. They've dedicated their lives to telling their stories in order that others don't go through the same experiences. And we now work with groups of people affected by genocide and crimes against humanity in other societies. And we commemorate events such as the Srebrenica massacre in Bosnia. You're already supporting us by attending this event. Um, if you would like to go further, you can. Um, we are a charity with no core funding um, and every penny is gratefully received. It goes straight back into ensuring our work can continue. And I'm going to shamelessly put our link to our Just Giving page in our chat now. Shamelessly. Shamelessly. <laughs> every penny, as I say, it goes straight back into ensuring our work continue and thank you very big thank you to anyone who donated when registering for this event um, we completely appreciate if you aren't able to donate we appreciate you being here anyway you can also follow us on social media um, and that's totally free and you can sign up for our monthly newsletter updates also free to keep up to date with our work and you can share that far and wide and you can do all of this uh, by going to the top right hand corner of our main web page and clicking on give and help or you can scroll right to the bottom of our homepage and you can see that you can sign up there and also there's make a donation too. So these events, we are doing online survivor talks um, as well and they are available to book for schools and, um, and, think, and if you have a group who you'd like to book a talk for that you can get in touch. But these talks, um, they are about four themes as well. They're, these themes are transnational Jewish identities at the periphery, archives, collections, and material memory, sexuality, desire, and the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism and perpetration, which is what we are here for this evening. So this theme is visible in the exhibition and in our learning program for groups of all ages, and which also has digital sessions available to book now. 
this idea of what roles were involved in the Holocaust and what exactly being a perpetrator means. I'm now going to hand over to our co-director, Dr. Chelsea Sambells, researcher and lecturer at the University of Huddersfield with specialisms in humanitarian history, children's history, and 20th century Europe to continue the event. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you so much for all your technical support. You're brilliant and very much, uh, we are very indebted to your efforts. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. And I'd love to share with you uh, the introduction for our two speakers. Tonight, we have Dr. Alex Kay, uh, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Potsdam and a lifetime fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He specializes in the history of Germany from 1918 to 1945, national socialist policies of extermination, and comparative research on genocide and violence. He is the author of Exploitation, Re Resettlement, Mass Murder, Political and Economic Planning for German Occupation Policy in the Soviet Union, um, as well as The Making of an SS Killer, The Life of Colonel Alfred Filbert, 1905 to 1990, and 20 other book contributions, articles, and peer-reviewed journals. Welcome this evening, Dr. Alex Kay. We also have Dr. Daniel Lee. He's a senior lecturer in modern French history at the Queen Mary University of London. He specializes in the history of Jews in France and North Africa during the Holocaust. His first book, Pétain's Jewish Children, French Jewish Youth and the Vichy Regime, explored the coexistence between the young French Jews and the Vichy regime. His second book, The SS Officer's Armchair, examines the life of a low ranking SS officer from Stuttgart, whose personal documents were recently discovered sewn into the cushion of this armchair. He is currently a uh, leading British Academy project, he is currently leading a British Academy project traces of Jewish memory in contemporary Tunisia and regularly contributes to BBC Radio 3 as a new generation thinker. Welcome to Daniel Lee, Dr. Daniel Lee. It's lovely to have you both here tonight, gentlemen, and um, in order to, I mean, the reason this event is happening is because I had the, the privilege of reading both your biographies. And there are so many uh, surprising similarities and contrasts, but similarities between the, the biographies of uh, Alfred Filbert and Robert Griesinger, the exemplary research um, to dis discuss and explore the kinds of perpetration that these two individuals committed during the Holocaust um, was a very uh, interesting and fascinating thing for me to experience and read as a scholar. So without further ado, I'm not going to uh, talk too much. I'm going to let you guys talk. Let's begin with Alex. I would like to know what or who is your book about? So um, Alex Joseph, if you could maybe share the photos. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea, for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks to both you and the Centre for the invitation and for hosting this event. Um, as you know, I have particularly fond memories of Huddersfield because I did my undergraduate degree here. So it's, it's great to be back, if only via Zoom. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been almost uh, five years, actually, since my biography of Alfred Filbert, a mid-level SS officer and, and frontline Holocaust perpetrator, was published. So in preparation for this event, I had to return to the book and refresh my memory just a little. Now, as you can see from the first slide, um, my book is entitled The Making of an SS Killer, The Life of Colonel Alfred Filbert, 1905 to 1990. And this title has a, a double meaning. It firstly refers to the process by which a fairly ordinary man in early 20th century Germany became a killer for the SS at the age of 35 and responsible for the murder of at least 18,000 innocent civilians in the space of only four months, overwhelmingly Lithuanian, Belarusian, and Russian Jews, men, women, and children. <clears throat> uh, secondly, the, the book title refers to a, a most remarkable and, and bizarre turn of events in the mid-1980s, in the final years of Filbert's life, where he found himself starring in a feature film as, yes, you guessed it, an SS killer. Maybe we could see the second slide there. Yeah, that was taken on set during the shooting of the film in 1983. 
I still think this title, The Making of an SS Killer, was and, and remains a very fitting one for the story of this particular SS officer. And while refreshing my memory over the past few weeks, um, it did occur to me that this book could have been equally called something like The Nine Lives of Alfred Filbert. Um, and it goes something like this. Trainee lawyer, counterintelligence officer, mass murderer, disgraced employee, fugitive, bank manager, defendant, convicted criminal, film star. Importantly, Filbert embarked on, on several stations in this singular career path of his own free will. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, that's a photo from his uh, university file in the um, late 1920s. Like many young German men of his generation, Filbert had the very real prospect of a career in law. Instead, he made the conscious decision to pursue a career in the intelligence services in Nazi Germany. He applied to the SS Security Service in Berlin, more commonly known by its abbreviation SD, and began full time uh, work as a full time employee of the SD in 1935. Next slide, please. In spring 1941, along with a handful of other SS officers, Filbert volunteered to command an SS task force in the impending war of annihilation against the Soviet Union, knowing full well that his assignment would include murdering Jewish civilians. During the first five weeks of the military campaign, all the SS task forces, 19 in number, spread across four operational groups, murdered primarily Jewish men of military service age. Within his operational group, which comprised five task forces, it was common knowledge that Filbert's unit was particularly rigorous in its approach to the murder of the Jewish population. And then at the end of July 1941, about five weeks into the campaign, Filbert's task force became the first to commence systematic shooting operations against women and children. On this occasion, he was admittedly acting on orders given to him by his boss, Reinhard Heydrich, rather than on his own initiative. However, it's likely that Heydrich saw this commission as a test run for the other commanders and entrusted Filbert with the task because he knew that Filbert advocated 100% the aims of the regime in the words of a co-defendant at Filbert's subsequent trial. Next slide, please. Furthermore, the timing of the trans transition to killing Jewish women and children differed among the individual SS task forces. And one reason for this divergent timing was doubtless the varying zeal and commitment of the individual commanders. So the point I'm trying to make here is that whilst there is no, no indication that Filbert actively set out at the beginning of his career to become a state executioner as the commander of a, a mobile killing squad, or to exercise some similar function, by repeatedly placing himself at, at what we might call the sharp end of the stick, it became ever more likely that he would receive such an assignment. One further ingredient uh, elevates this story to the status of a family saga, namely the fate of Filbert's older brother, Otto. Next slide, please, Alex. In 1938, after 12 years in the United States, Otto Filbert, whom you can see here, returned to Germany with his wife and two sons on a trial basis. Unable, however, to adapt to the new way of life in Nazi Germany, he resolved to return to the US. Before he could do so, however, he let slip a careless remark about the failure of the assassination attempt on Hitler's life in November 1939. Denounced by a work colleague, he was arrested by the Gestapo and convicted of treachery. He then spent four years in prison and on the personal orders of Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, a further year in Buchenwald concentration camp near Weimar. Next photo, please. After this, he was, it was then transferred to a penal battalion where he in fact perished before the end of the war. So seen against the backdrop of his brother's, brother Otto's arrest and imprisonment, 
It seems that Alfred Filbert was perhaps attempting with his murderous fervor as the commander of a mobile killing squad to prove his devotion to the National Socialist cause and his ideological reliability. Final slide, please. To conclude, if the case of an SS officer whose older brother was a political prisoner of the Nazis had been almost unique, if Filbert had made a name for himself as one of the most radical enforcers of the genocide against Soviet Jews, his aforementioned appearance on the silver screen in the mid 1980s was an utterly unprecedented twist in the remarkable life of this particular SS killer. The only time a convicted Nazi mass murderer played the role of a mass murderer in a feature film. Thank you for listening. Incredible. Thank you, Alex. That gives us all a real good taste of what uh, Alfred Philbert was about and that the fact that he starred in a film, that is just incredible. So uh, before we unpack all of that juicy detail and very interesting conversation, perhaps we can hear from uh, Daniel. Daniel, tell us what your book is about, please. Probably interrupting everybody from Googling the film. Everyone's probably very busy downloading this film to find out, you know, how this man was able to sort of portray himself all those years later. So we'll just, uh, I will definitely be doing that later. Um, thank you, Chelsea, for the invitation. Uh, wonderful to be here, wonderful to be in discussion with Alex, whose work I admire greatly. So it's a real, real pleasure. So to answer your question very simply, uh, I was living in uh, Italy. I'd finished my PhD. I was living in Italy doing research in about 2011, 2012. Uh, I, I was already sort of writing about the Second World War. I, do, I was publishing a book at the time and somebody sort of came up to me at this event I was at and said to me, oh, you're this new historian in town who works on the Second World War. I've been meaning to talk to you because something extraordinary has just happened to my mother. And I just suddenly thought, well, okay, people do come up to me very often when they find out I'm a historian of the Second World War. But, you know, they want to tell me about grandfathers who might have been in the resistance or aunts who, who were deported or whatever. It happens given what we do. But these things were always a very long time ago, 70, 80 years ago. Things don't just happen to people's mothers. Anyway, so at that moment, this, this woman just told me how her, her mother had just taken this old armchair to be reupholstered. And when she went to collect it a few days later, the man who was doing the work in Amsterdam was really quite visibly cross and shaken with her. And he sort of approached her, he said, what is this? I don't do work for Nazis or their families. And he, he handed her this bundle of documents that he'd discovered sewn into the cushion of the armchair, all of which belonged to one man called Robert Griesinger. And every document was sort of covered in Nazi era stamps. So swastikas and what have you. And, you know, this woman sort of stood there flabbergasted. I think we have a picture of the chair. We might be able to show it. Um, totally, she, she had absolutely no idea who this man was, Robert Griesinger, nor any idea how these documents ended up in her armchair. So here we see a perfectly ordinary looking armchair, perfectly respectable, nothing Nazi about it. And then uh, in the next slide, we see uh, an example of one of the, uh, that was for example, one of the things we, we discover inside the armchair. So this happens to be one of Robert Griesinger's passports from the Second World War. Um, so this, this woman just sort of said to me, well, you know, I. I my mother has no idea who this is. We don't know as a family. He wasn't related to us, which is what the chair restorer had presumed. Actually, the family had bought the chair in the 1960s. They, the, the mother, her mother was, was a young student in Prague. They were Czech, they weren't even Dutch. And she was just sort of like all of us were when we we're students, sort of running around secondhand shops, vintage uh, st stores just looking for some cheap secondhand furniture. She saw this armchair, she fell in love with it. And then in the 1980s, when, when families were allowed to leave communist Czechoslovakia, some families, she took this armchair with her on the train to the Netherlands. And it's sort of been with them ever since. Every move they've made as a family, whenever you sort of look at family pictures, you sort of see this chair in the background. And so this woman in Florence just sort of said to me, I really want to know more about this man. I sat on this chair my whole life. I did my homework on it. I didn't know I was sitting on these documents, obviously. 
you know, who is Robert Griesinger and how on earth did his documents end up inside my armchair? So that's really where my story started. I, I, I went to Prague because of course, at first I Googled the name and there would probably have been far fewer hits than somebody uh, like Filbert, Alex's particular Nazi, who, you know, had at least had a trial or, or something. He might have been Googleable to Alex when he first came across him. Whereas Griesinger, absolutely nothing. Absolutely, you know, his name appears nowhere, appeared nowhere online, no books, nothing. So it was really sort of a needle in a haystack from the very, very start. But in any case, I was at first so seduced and obsessed with the chair. I really wanted to know more about the armchair itself. I even thought that, you know, I'd just write a history of the chair and forget the man inside of it. So I sort of printed out dozens of color pictures of the chair. I went, I, perhaps we could return to that picture. I sort of ran around the streets of Prague in 2011, 2012, interviewing chair makers because I wanted to know everything about this chair. How much did it cost? Who is its intended buyer? Uh, was it a chair made in locally in Prague? Had it been brought from Germany? Had it belonged to a Jewish family? We know, for example, that tens of thousands of pieces of furniture, which were made in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, and had belonged to Jewish families, once those families lost their properties or had been deported, so much furniture was then seized and shipped east, uh, either to uh, furnish the homes, in Germany of, of, of German families, or indeed in the new offices that were springing up all over Central and Eastern Europe. So I was sort of going around Prague with this picture, finding out as much as I could. And people with a lot of chair makers, you know, everybody was sort of giving me various pieces of information and confirming that yes, this was a locally produced chair. It was definitely Czech, but nobody seemed particularly uh, nobody really raised an eyebrow when I mentioned that there were these hidden documents inside, which I thought was incredibly interesting. I sort of remember one guy sort of blowing, smoking his cigarette outside his shop. And I was sort of saying, oh, well, inside of this chair, there were pause, Nazi documents. And he sort of took a puff on his cigarette and he said, sir, this was communist Czechoslovakia, for God's sake. I find hidden objects every single day inside armchairs, mattresses, what have you. So, you know, the reaction was very, very different between the two upholsterers, one in Amsterdam and one in Prague. But of course, when I'm in Prague, while I was doing the research on the chair, I obviously trundled down to the archives in Prague and, and sort of asked questions there about who was this man, Robert Griesinger. And that's when my interest in him became much more apparent because the magnificent archives in Prague, uh, really well organized, very well arranged. I was, it didn't take long at all to discover uh, that he was in Prague during the occupation, that he was in the SS, that he was married, and it's no surprise, it's, no, it's not no spoiler for me to say it here because I say it on the first page of my book that, that he died in Prague in 1945. So my story is really about, uh, of course it's about this armchair, but it's also much more about thinking more about how as historians, we're able to put back some of these pieces together, how to reassemble the life of somebody who really left very, very little trace on history. Does that answer your question or do you want me to? Absolutely, thank you, Daniel. I wasn't sure if you'd frozen or not to be totally honest. Absolutely, well, and it's perfect because it segues ways right into my next question for both of you because um, one of the things that you both mentioned is this is, and, and you know, is going to be one of the core issues within, within constructing a biography because these, these two Nazis, if I can call it your Nazis, your Nazis are, uh, not the high profile Nazis that um, would be perhaps easier to research. And so that would be my next question is, you know, what are the challenges or the unique opportunities that both of you discovered when writing your biographies about not just Nazis, but ordinary ones, mid-level ones? Maybe let's start with Alex and then move into Daniel, let's see. Well, Daniel is, is, of course, absolutely right that um, my Nazi, if we want to stick with this terminology, 
um, my Nazi was certainly more Googleable than than his was when we we started on our um, respective projects. Although not dramatically so, um, even among people working in the field, uh, Alfred Filbert was relatively unknown. It's, it'd been mentioned here and there in a couple of works, but there hadn't been any kind of biographical, even article on him or anything of that nature. So he was relatively unknown and particularly so given his, um, given his significance, I would say, he was important in, in many ways, certainly as a frontline Holocaust perpetrator. Um, so to answer your question, when embarking on a, on a biography of a, a mid-level functionary, obviously source material and documentary evidence are all important. And the death of source material on most of these mid-level Nazi functionaries is the main reason why there are so few biographies of them. Uh, I think Daniel would agree that our biographies are um, two of, of very few on mid-level perpetrators. And uh, the unusually extensive amount of material on Philbert was crucial in my decision to write about him and, and not about some other Nazi. And in addition to the large number of official files, um, including his PhD file, 82 files from his, his trial in Berlin in 1962, um, his file as a legal trainee. In addition to all those things, um, I discovered two interviews that have been conducted with him. One in 1969 and one in 1983. The first one had been in prison or during his time in prison and the second on the set of this film I mentioned earlier. And the second interview was in fact recorded on film. And I think the, the discovery of these two interviews were perhaps the clincher for me in deciding to, to write about Philbert. So I'd say that that's the main challenge, um, having enough sources to portray the protagonist in a sufficiently fleshed out way for him or her to be discernible as a real person and not just as a representative of a particular generation or of a particular type of perpetrator, but as a real person. In terms of unique opportunities, the second part of your question, Chelsea, I think that if this source material is on hand, as it was in the case of Philbert, it allows us to paint a portrait of a real human being, a real person with desires, motivations, and, and personal agency. Someone who is perhaps not quite as abstract or unrelatable as major historical figures like Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goering tend to be. And lest anyone think it odd to want to relate to a perpetrator, I should add that I mean this less in the sense of sympathizing with and more in the sense of understanding a perpetrator. Um, and maybe at this point I could quote historian Timothy Snyder who once wrote, it is less appealing but morally more urgent to understand the actions of the perpetrators rather than those of the victims. The moral danger after all is never that one might become a victim but that one might be a perpetrator or a bystander. Excellent. Absolutely. That, you know, uh, yes, <laughs> it's, it's the, 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 the bit about it. And to be fair, everyone, I just have to point out that in uh, Alex's biography, over half of it are all notes, right? Or is, is his diligent uh, homework essentially for constructing this biography. So Thank you for that. I mean, and, and and where I go with it is the 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 data that you give in your biography about his uh, acts of violence, his his total and absolute perpetration of the Holocaust in the chaos that was the Eastern Front. Like, I mean, I, we all know the Nazis are ex exceptional record keepers, but was that a particularly difficult part of your research? Was to reconstruct the events of 1941 with regards to his actions specifically? There was actually on that particular episode or that particular kind of period of his life, there, um, I discovered an astounding amount of material. And as you say, Chelsea, the, um, the Nazis were just in, in incredible record keepers. Mm. And these, these SS task forces, the Einsatzgruppen, operating behind the front in the East, 
They sent back weekly reports to Berlin detailing exactly how many people they'd killed, who they'd killed, uh, what supposed reason they'd killed them for, and that kind of thing. And then the, all these task forces were, of course, assigned to army units, regular German army units, who submitted their, their own reports as well and had war diaries. Um, and then in addition to, to those sources, um, I was also able to draw on reports compiled from 1943 onwards by the Soviet Extraordinary State Commission, mm. which sent out people to across the Soviet territories, the formerly German-occupied Soviet territories, and interviewed victims and witnesses about massacres and compiled an incredible amount of material and, 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 um, and, and reports on this. Now, you've got to handle this material with care, of course, particularly when it comes to the numbers, but taking all this information together, it was possible to, um, to, to paint an incredibly accurate picture of Philbert's actions as well. And, and that was how I was able to discover, for example, um, that his unit in those four months where he's com he was commander, his unit was responsible for killing far, far more people than we had hitherto assumed. Um, we'd thought it was about 11,500 in those first four months, which was, is bad enough, you know, is terrible enough. But it was actually at least 18,000 at a conservative estimates, right? It's more of an estimate because I was able to compile these, these detailed figures. It's really at least 18,000, possibly as many as 22,000. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of material on those four months and, and that's why I devote two full chapters in the book just to that four month period. Oh, fair enough. No, uh, fascinating, fascinating. Now, Daniel, <laughs> your your task, obviously, I mean, as you pointed out, might have been almost uh, more difficult in a way, because unlike Filbert, who was uh, interrogated and tried and persecuted after the war, Robert uh, Griesinger just you know, sort of vanished in mm. the chaos of 1945. So, you know, you don't get that same level of uh, construction of his life and his and his crimes. So what a same question to you, right. to you, what were the challenges and opportunities that you experienced when writing this biography? No, absolutely. I knew from the start that he died uh, in 1945. So I was I wasn't, of course, expecting to find any sort of trial or anything like that. I thought maybe there might be some kind of denazification dossier, which of course might have existed for certain people, even if they were dead. Uh, but no, absolutely not. I, I went to Stuttgart, uh, the town where he was born. He was born at a very similar time to Filbert. Uh, they were born part of a, exactly the same generation. So it's it's, it's another wonderful reason that we're here talking about both of these men tonight. Um, but no, the, the, the administrative side of things was very, very tough. I wasn't able to rely on the, um, a lot of documents I would have liked to. So it, it really, in the end, amounted to a lot of hoovering up, sort of traveling around. Uh, you know, this would be totally impossible today with, with the current pandemic situation, but just going to a ton of different archives and just sometimes just taking snippets and snippets away from, um, from documents, uh, I was fortunate, uh, which I suppose, um, and I, in the same way that Alex was, that uh, uh, Griesinger had a had an SS file which had survived. Most SS files, individual SS files, uh, did not survive the end of the war. So there was that was sort of the first big dossier I, I was able to get my hands on after I left Prague. Um, but you know, as much as I travelled and as much as I was trying to get my hands on various pieces of information about him. I was constantly frustrated by the, a lot of the silences in the archives. The documents often weren't responding with personal information that I would have liked them to. Uh, and so I, one day, in a, in a very I was very frustrated and I sort of, I thought, you know, I've got to know more about this guy. I just, I was in Stuttgart, I, I picked up the phone book and I just called every single person in the phone book with the name Griesinger because I just wanted to know more about him. Uh, and of course, everybody thought I was crazy and was selling them something, something. So they just hung up. But eventually, somebody actually said, "Oh yes, Robert Griesinger. That was my uh, my father's brother, my uncle. Well, why are you interested in him?" And so I had to, you know, quickly think fast and come up with some cock and bull story about 
about, you know, because if I had told him, oh, I just found his documents in an armchair, he'd have thought I was totally crazy. So, uh, you know, I, I, I managed somehow to arrange a meeting with him and um, the nephew, as soon as he gave me the address, uh, I, was, I was delighted because it was exactly the same address that Robert Griesinger had lived in before the war. So it was still the family house. And it was just so wonderful to have this access to, to the family. And I know, of course, from Alex's book that he did, he also did something rather similar. He was able, I think, am I right, Alex, that you also struggled to find the relatives and you actually had to sort of also do some cold calling of your own. So, or am I misremembering? Uh, absolutely. Um, although I think you, you were certainly more successful, Daniel, where that's concerned. I mean, you were able to speak to um, birth of the daughters, which is just amazing. I was I located one of Philbert's sons, but he didn't actually want to talk to me. And this was not because he thought his dad was oh, so great, but actually the, uh, for the, the opposite reason that he had already kind of gone through all of this per personally and just didn't want to unearth it all again and have to discuss it all again. So we did right. have um, some written correspondence. He actually sent me a copy of Philbert's death certificate, which I hadn't been able to get my hands on at that point, and he answered a number of questions. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to interview him, although I, I did interview one of um, Otto Philbert's sons, personally, mm. um, which was great. But I think that's why our stories are, in fact, very different in that respect, that, you know, my the relatives of Robert Griesinger sort of welcome me with open arms, like, come in, come in, like, you know, stay for lunch, that sort of thing. Like, what can we, what, what, come and be, speak to us. We, we don't know anything about this man. He died in 1945. We had no relationship with him whatsoever. What can you tell us about him? Extraordinary. And then of course, you know, it came to the, the bit when I first met them that I, I saw, I was in this old house in Stuttgart. It hadn't been bombed. And it was one of those houses where no, nothing had ever been thrown out um, of the house. You could just see like documents sort of, you know, coming from sort of every nook and cranny. And I sort of said, oh, I don't suppose you have any documents about Robert Griesinger. And they sort of, the nephew like sort of looked at his wife and they're like, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, and I think often with um, oral history, people aren't going to sort of give you all the documents on your first interview. It, it does take time. You do need to build up a relationship with your subject. So they didn't give me anything on the first visit, but the second visit was, was much more fruitful. The second visit, by the time I'd left, I'd sort of, I'd left with like bundles of, I had his mother's diary. She kept a diary from the day he was born. It had all sorts of documents. Uh, and of course I was also, the, cousin, the, the, the nephew was able to put me in touch with Robert Griesinger's daughters. So that as well, having having privileged access to them, all of this was able to sort of help me uh, recreate the sort of man that he was and find much more interesting personal nuggets about him. This kind of work, I don't think Alex or I would be able to do this in 15 or 20 years, because that generation, I don't think, you know, we're talking about people in their 80s now and these kind of documents lying around the house, in my experience, when, when, when people sort of a, a, a move uh, to, a, to a retirement home or pass away, relatives often don't look after these documents. They, oh, who does this belong to? I don't recognize this. Boom, goes on a skip outside. So I really, I feel like very, very lucky that in a sense I was able to get my hands on so many of these documents now because in 20 years time, these documents which look ordinary are the, one, are the first ones that just end up elsewhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and uh, what, uh, uh, could, you know, contrasting stories too, that on one hand, some, some descendants don't want to talk to you. And then on the other hand, some are welcoming you back and giving you mother's diaries. I mean, like, that's, that's incredible. So, you know, and as we all know, constructing history and being a historian is sometimes just luck of the draw, you know, at that moment in time. And just, so I'm going to move on though, with the idea that we need to keep on our time. And I've got another question for you. So thank you for that, but by writing a biography, uh, so, so fast and fascinating, just uh, the way you've constructed it, such high quality work. Um, so 
clearly we've got to talk about perpetration. We've got to talk about motivations um, because there's a lot of similarities and differences between these two men. So everyone just bear with me because I may be the only one or maybe of a handful in the room that has read both of these fabulous biographies. Um, so I'm gonna just go through some similarities. They're both of your Nazis, let's call it that, right? Both born within a year of each other. Filbert was born in 1905, Griesinger in 1906. Both born and grew up in West Germany, one in Rhineland, the other in Baden-Württemberg. Both studied at similar universities in the West, Filbert at Hagiesen and Heidelberg, Griesinger at Tübingen. Both joined student societies, they both fenced as students both academically adequate, totally unexceptional students, right? Uh, near the end of the studies, they joined the SS. Filbert also joins the, the Nazi party while Grasinger joins the Nazi Lawyers Association. Both earn doctorates in law. Both are ambitious, slightly career obsessed. Both have career interruptions. Filbert remains in the SD in 1941, but then uh, is suspended until 1944. Grasinger goes and does some teaching, right, for a little while, uh, but intermittently serving in the, in the Wehrmacht. And we know that these similarities, though, are also typified by the fact that both of you state in your biographies that this kind of background, age, being from Western Germany, participation in student clubs, uh, the law profession, is heavily typical of Nazis at this period. But there's also a few differences between these two gentlemen. Filbert is middle class. Griesinger is more wealthy or upper class. Filbert loves his father while his mother is the strict authority, while as Griesinger loves his mother while the father is the strict authority. Um, Filbert marries in his 30s, Griesinger in his 20s. Filbert goes into the SD in Berlin. Griesinger goes into the Gestapo in, in Württemberg. Um, Filbert receives five promotions in two and a half years, and Griesinger only has two promotions in four years, right? It's just a little bit different. Filbert is, we, as we know, the violent Nazi commander in Lithuania and in Belarus, while Griesinger becomes a desk Nazi after 1943 in Prague. One survived and went to trial and made a movie, and, and the other didn't. So in short, these men come from same backgrounds in many ways, same ambitions, same age, same education, same adequate intelligence, but took vastly different paths. So how do you, as their biographers, account for their vastly different styles of perpetration? Alex, let's start with you. Thank you. Another interesting question. Uh, I'll keep my answer relatively short because I think I did, in my introduction, I did touch on this, this um, aspect of choice in Filbert's um, biography that he does a kind of crucial moment in his life, he, he takes the more radical choice when there was actually no necessity to do that. Um, in, in terms of background, Filbert was the son of a military man, a professional soldier. His father was a Sergeant Major in peacetime and then promoted to captain and company commander during the First World War. And as a member of the so-called war youth generation um, who had been too young to fight in the war, Filbert wanted to prove himself. Um, this is definitely the, the impression I got. And Chelsea, you mentioned that he, he was close to his father. He really admired and adored his father. And Filbert wanted to prove himself, to distinguish himself in the field, like just like his father had done. And um, Incidentally, during his 1969 interview with the British psychiatrist Henry Dix while in prison, Philbert referred to himself more than once as a soldier. Now, of course, he wasn't a soldier in the traditional sense. He was in the SS. He was a member of its foreign intelligence service. He wasn't in the army. Um, so I think in Philbert's case, there was this long-standing fundamental desire to distinguish himself in the field. And the fate of his older brother, which I mentioned earlier, then effectively elevated this desire to a determination to prove his ideological reliability and commitment to the Nazi regime in the most radical way possible by leading a mobile killing squad in the field, engaging in the deadly violence that was the, the hallmark of the Nazis. 
That's interesting because you sort of pulling on his his careerist ambitions and maybe that comes from himself as well as the cultural background that he grew up when with his father being in the, the military, but also that issue with his brother. Uh, it's all very personal and very interesting. Okay, so Daniel, same same question. How do you account for Griesinger's rather maybe aloof style of perpetration? Mm. No, it's a great question. And I think as we were just, uh, as, as Alex was talking, I thought of an, another similarity possibly might be that both of these men grew up in a place where there probably weren't that many Jews. We weren't talking, they didn't grow up in Berlin or Frankfurt or a place with like a vibrant Jewish community. So for somebody like Griesinger growing up in Stuttgart, of course there were some Jews, there were probably about four, maybe 5,000 Jews. But it, I don't think that the he or his family would have had too much interaction with Jews growing up. There was one, two Jewish boys in his class at school, four Jewish boys he, uh, in his year group. Um, and of course, everybody would have known who the Jewish kids were because it would, even looking at the class registers, it still sort of says your religion. So I'm thinking we nevertheless get, as I mentioned earlier, thanks to his mother's diary, it's very easy to see the kind of family he came from and the kind of newspaper clippings that would have caught her eye that she would cut out and sort of stick into her diary. We knew what political party she was drawn to in the 1920s and 30s. And these were parties that were pretty extreme when you think about it, very, very, very right-wing, nationalist, anti-Weimar, um, anti anti Bolshevik, anti Jewish, etc., but not Nazi necessarily. The, well, not at all. Like the party they voted for, his parents, the DNVP, was a totally different party to the Nazi Party. But my point by raising this is that for somebody like Robert Griesinger, it probably didn't take that much coming from the background that he did to sort of realize in 1933 that he needed to, to, well, that he recognized which horse he needed to bet on, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So in 1933, as I said, well, as we've discussed earlier, he had gone to the most fun, he came from a wonderfully upper middle-class family, went to one of the most right-wing universities in Germany, had joined one of these student societies, made, made the right sorts of friends, all on the extreme right. No evidence whatsoever that he'd been interested in the Nazis before 1933. And in fact, in Stuttgart and even for, for Württemberg, it was very far behind when you look at the numbers of people who, who sort of voted for Nazis or joined Nazi organizations. Unlike the rest of Germany, that part of that part of the country never it never took off in the same way as it did elsewhere. So Griesinger was not a Nazi in 1933. Yet within a year, what we see is he's joined all sorts of Nazi organizations. He doesn't join the party because he can't, because in spring 1933, uh, uh, there's a moratorium put in place that bans membership. So he's sort of sitting there think in Stuttgart thinking to himself, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I need, you know, I've got my PhD in law. My ambition is to be a senior civil servant locally in, in the state of Württemberg in Stuttgart but I haven't, I'm not a member of this new thing yet. Nevertheless, my, my, my background is so good. I have the right connections. I know all the right people because I went to university with them. It's not going to be that difficult for me to make the transition. He's able to join the SS very early on, even without Nazi party membership. He knows all the right people. He was at Tübingen with them. And what's amazing is, is, is how sort of little uh, he sort of dedicates to his SS life. He's not somebody who, as we saw in those wonderful images from Alex, he's not somebody who is wearing the uniform every day to work. On the contrary, he hardly ever wears the uniform. He is, he is in the, mem he, he sort of goes to SS meetings, he pays his membership fees to the SS, but he's not working in an SS office. He's not working in a concentration camp. He has a totally, He's able to sort of dip in and out as SS member uh, uh, in SS activities as it suits him. A lot of the activities he goes to in the 1930s, the SS activities, he'll sort of you know some some physical events, so sort of training, sort of physical education. 
uh, weekly or monthly events with songs and theater and speeches. Often they were encouraged to bring their wives. And what's interesting in both of the cases of both of the men that we're looking at is how difficult it was for them to get married. It wasn't, you couldn't just get married in a week or two. For somebody, if you were part of the SS, you really needed permission from Berlin to get married. And Griesinger wanted to get married in September 1935, he puts in his application, but it takes months and months and months of sort of going backwards and forwards uh, with Berlin until he's granted permission. And his wife, his, his fiance at the time, has to go up, really sort of go through the most awful um, interrogations, if you like, from the SS to make sure that she would be able to produce four healthy children. They would sort of measure her hips, they would check her period cycle, etc. cetera. Uh, and all of this is, is well documented in the archive. Um, so, Another, I suppose, thing to mention here is he goes, so even when he's working at the Gestapo, he's a lawyer, he's wearing his, a suit to work. He's not wearing a uniform to work, an SS uniform to work. As you rightly said, he's working behind a desk every single way, every single day. But this actually ends up sort of screwing him over, if you like, because when we get to the war, when we get to 1939, he finds himself being called up to the army, to the Wehrmacht. And this is the last place he wants to be. He wants to be with all his university friends in some fancy schmantz office somewhere in the East. He does not want to be in, in the Wehrmacht with everybody else. So he, his letters from this time, from 19, uh, uh, autumn 1939, spring 1940, are him sort of sitting in, on the border with France when nothing's happening because all the action is happening in the East. And all he's trying to do is get himself moved there. He's trying to get desperately to get moved away from the Wehrmacht into a job in the East. Um, and so that really is, of course, very different to what we see uh, with Alex's Filbert, who is obviously all guns blazing, involved uh, in a uniform in the SS uh, from very, very early on. This is not what happens with Robert Griesinger. It takes him a very long time uh, before he's able to uh, secure a position for himself in the East. I don't know if we have time to talk about that now, perhaps we can come back to it later because I'm, I'm conscious of time. But I pick up very briefly on two points that Daniel's made, which I think are rather pertinent. Do we have time? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah go for it. Absolutely. No, I mean, everybody, you're not getting out of here until quarter after anyway, so, you know. <laughs> um, the point you made, Daniel, about uh, greasing and not coming from an area that was particularly densely populated um, with, with Jews. Um, and I, I recall Phil, Philbert saying something um, later on, I think when he was uh, in prison, saying um, that he'd actually, during his, during his uh, years taking dancing lessons in his youth, he'd actually been invited to many uh, Jewish families to visit their, their homes, and his older brother had actually socialised with Jewish families. Now, obviously, this was an attempt to um, uh, to claim that he, 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 he had relationships with Jews and he had no hatred of Jews and he wasn't anti-Semitic, etc. But actually the more pertinent point there, I think, is that um, many of these later perpetrators actually did not have any or hadn't had any encounters or relationships with Jews before they started murdering them later on. I think many of the perpetrators came from parts of Germany where there were very few Jews and they would uh, probably not encountered them during their uh, earlier life. Um, and I think it's often the places where um, there are very few members of a particular minority group that, that's then targeted that is most radical because they do, they're not forced to interact with this, these members of this minority and they therefore don't, uh, they don't have to adapt um, and, and assimilate these people. Um, and therefore, I think, I think uh, in, in places like Berlin or, or what was then Breslau or Frankfurt, I think there was perhaps somewhat less anti-Semitic sentiment mm -hmm. because there, there were bigger Jewish communities. I mean, that's my feeling about it. So I think that's quite striking. This, absence of relationships with Jews in the earlier lives of the perpetrators before they then started killing them. 
And the, just the other, the other point I thought was interesting, um, you use this phrase, Daniel, that greasing a new witch horse to bet on. Um, also later in his life, Philbert made the statement, all the ambitious ones were national socialists. When he, he was referring to his university days studying law in Gießen and Heidelberg, all the ambitious ones were national socialists. So I think there was very much this feeling that, yeah, if I bet on the right horse, if I bet on the Nazi horse, I can have everything. I can have this career that I deserve and uh, I can quickly rise through the ranks. I've got to bet on the right horse. I think I note when I was doing the research, I was really struck by the extent of uh, the right-wing nationalist elements that were taking place in German universities at that time. These were hotbeds of uh, of the extreme right, even not just among the students, but also among the staff. And that's something that I noticed uh, at the university where, where, where Griesinger was actually working in the late 1930s, because just going through the lists of former professors from the 1930s, uh, what you see is just so many members of the SS, of the SA, uh, et cetera, professors in, uh, from, from all kinds of departments. And I found it very interesting when thinking about after the war, how, how long it took for universities in Germany to really sort of go through their past from the 1930s and 40s and to really look about what their faculty had actually done. I mean, some of the universities started extremely late. I, mean, I don't know about your particular university, Alex, uh, sorry to put you on the spot like this, but has, you, do, has your university ever sort of um, gone through its Nazi past and like really look to see what role it played under the uh, during the 30s and 40s. I must confess that I know there is I know of some universities that have done it in Germany. I'm not aware of Potsdam having done it. Uh, sorry that I can't be certain on that, um, but I'm going to go and check it out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, not right now, of course, but I'm going to go it. <laughs> okay. Oh. I wish we had like another four hours and I would be able to ask so many more questions. I'm going to move it on in, in the case of time, uh, gentlemen, but I, I thank you for this because it, it uh, demonstrates sort of maybe how Robert Griesinger sort of fell in to Nazism, that it was uh, a vehicle for him to maybe uh, go on and achieve things in his career, but that it just sort of, it was happening at the same time as he wanted to sort of go in that direction as opposed to him being a fanatical Nazi, whereas with Filbert, it kind of is the opposite. Although he still has something to prove on a personal level. I mean, would you, Alex, would you call, if, if, if Griesinger is not a fanatical Nazi, as we would term it, right? The, the truly anti-Semitic, perhaps ideologically motivated Nazi, would you say that Filbert was? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you've asked this question because I've just seen in the chat that somebody's written um, the, the, the surprise that we're not um, attaching more importance to ideology. Uh, I discuss this at length in my, in my book, particularly in the conclusion. Filbert was absolutely an ideological killer. Um, the British psychiatrist that interviews him in 1969 described him as, quote, a real fanatic and uh, attributes um, de SS dedication to him. And so I, I would say that um, Philbert's motivations for pursuing a career in National Socialism, culminating in, in active participation in crimes on a mass scale, were both careerist and ideological. I don't think we have to choose one or the other. I, I think perpetrators often have multiple motivations. It's not just one cause, one reason, one motivation. And for Philbert, it was definitely an opportunist and definitely a careerist. He wanted to become someone, he wanted to be someone, but he was absolutely 100% on board with the aims of the regime. And he demonstrated that fully um, during his four months in the East. And I would go so far as to say that Philbert's ambition and craving for recognition was strengthened and, and significantly justified by his ideology and his belief that it belonged to the master race. His ideology kind of persuaded him that the career advancement, status and recognition, recognition he, he sought were, were no more than his due. He felt he had a right to success. So I, I would actually say that ideology and egotism were mutually reinforcing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, uh, yeah. No single uh, cause for why people do things, right? 
I'm going to ask my final question, and then we'll we'll see what uh, the the chat is saying. Um, because I think one of the we've talked about motivations. I also want to talk about responsibility and culpability a little bit, and just touch on that because we actually haven't talked about what they did exactly. Like, let, so I'm going to give them uh, the audience a snapshot of what what are the key findings, at least for me, with regards to the responsibility for the genocide of European Jews, Roma, other ethnic undesirables. So for Filbert, so Alex, for, for your research, has shown that his commando were directly responsible for the murders, as you say, of a conservative estimate of 18,000 people in Lithuania, Bela, uh, Belarus, and uh, Russia. Um, again, conservative estimates in the summer of 1941. These deaths though, included stripping victims naked before shooting them into pits, beating so-called partisans to death, including very old men and women, hanging others in public and also raping women. You also point out that his commando was, quote, not only the first commando with Einsatzgruppen B to, systematic, to begin systematically killing Jewish women and children, but in fact, the very first commando of any Einsatzgruppen to do so. Then for Griesinger, um, Daniel, your research has shown that from, especially from the spring of 1943 onwards, he was one of 25 leading men within the Ministry of Economics and Labor within Czechoslovakia or the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia that allocated forced labor from things like shoe factories to producing V1 and V2 rockets. You state that Griesinger during his first year in Prague quote, played his part in transporting 75,000 Czech men and women to join hundreds of thousands of forest workers from across occupied Europe to work for the Reich. Okay. So I don't really want to focus on moral or legal culpability, because I think we can all agree um, that both men are culpable for their crimes within this greater genocide, regardless of whether they're actively killing people themselves with the gun in the pits, or signing orders from a posh, luxurious office in Prague to exploit forced, forced labor. But these men are, as we get, the title says, they're mid-level managers. So unlike more high-profile Nazis, such as Hitler, or Goering, or Himmler, who could make all the decisions, these mid-level commanders, bureaucrats, were more restrained by their limited power, their career stagnation, their lack of autonomy within the Nazi system. So, what ex so uh, what extent can to what extent can we hold the Nazi bureaucracy to account for the perpetration of the Holocaust, or it is is it always the initiative of those individuals who work within that framework who should be held responsible? <laughs> <laughs> nice easy question for you. Let's start with Alex. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a, indeed a fundamental question, not just when it comes to the Holocaust and Nazi perpetrators, but I think when trying to understand the perpetrators of any instance of mass violence, was was the, the system and the framework that was decisive or, or was it personal initiative? The answer is that both play a role. Um, again, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be one, um, one cause, there can be multiple causes, and, and there are definitely here. Um, in Filbert's case, as a full-time employee of the SD, of the SS's uh, security service, since 1935, he was, he was embedded in an institutional subculture already favourable to, to tough uh, physical, legal, and biological remedies for perceived social ills years before actual genocide was initiated. And the, the Nazi state placed at the disposal of its followers means of violence normally beyond the reach of most people. It then authorized the use of extreme violence against several groups that had been relentlessly dehumanized and, and declared fair game. Um, you mentioned some of those groups, Chelsea, psychiatric patients, Jews, Slavs, Roma, and, and many, many other groups. And then in the context of the war, these groups no longer enjoyed any legal protection whatsoever and, and could be killed with impunity. So the Nazi regime created a framework that allowed its followers under cover of war to commit acts that would have been scarcely imaginable in other circumstances. Only in this way can we explain how it was possible for 
hundreds of thousands of murderers to settle back into normal civilian life after the war and reintegrate into German society as school teachers, bank managers, physicians, town mayors, or salesmen. During the Nazi period in general, and, and the war years in particular, conduct once considered wrong and unlawful now seemed right and justified. It was not only permitted, but in fact desired and therefore legitimate, or at least legitimated. And then when the war ended and the Nazi era with it, this behavior was again deemed wrong and unlawful. So clearly the framework, the system is of vital importance. Having said all that, there must be a reason why some people act in a certain way in a given situation and others don't. Or why some commit crimes with greater enthusiasm or display more initiative than others. And this, I think, is where human agency and choice come into play, or, or what you described as personal initiative, Chelsea. And the striking thing is that during the Nazi period, so few availed themselves of opportunities to avoid participation in atrocities. And these opportunities existed, you know, whether it was SS officers who successfully requested reassignment, or members of police battalions offered the chance to opt out of shooting operations, or concentration camp guards who chose not to actively abuse and torture prisoners. These opportunities existed, this choice existed. In short, there was, there was always a certain degree of personal freedom, of personal choice within the confines of the system. Thank you, Alex, yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so much to unpack. Uh, Daniel, uh, do you have anything to say to that or how do, how do you uh, put Griesinger in relation to this framework? Like I think Alex has summed it up absolutely beautifully <laughs> and I'm not sure what I could possibly say to add to that because I agree with, with, with so much of what he's, he's saying. And I just think that it's, it's so easy for us not just in history, but even today, it's so easy for us to fixate on these characters at the very top of the regime, no matter what, you know, today, when we see all this extremist politics all over the world, and we're looking at these people at the very top, the ones who, whose speeches make the newspapers, if we look at in Nazi Germany or Hitler and Himmler and all these very famous, and we, we sort of fixate on these extremist people and these extreme personalities. But I think what, we, what would be much more helpful uh, for us to do, perhaps as historians, is to think about, well, you know, who who was embracing these messages and why? Like what made, or even what makes this brand of nas nationalism so attractive? And I think that's where we start to like, when, when we hone in on people like Griesinger, when we hone in on people like Filbert, we see that these people at the top, they wouldn't be able to do what they did or what they do without so many tens and thousands, of millions even, of facilitators, of enablers, people for whom this message is genuinely attractive and they want to act on it. So I think we've got to, I mean, what I think we both try to do, you know, in our book is to look, is, is to really return texture and agency to some of these lower ranking uh, in, individuals and to really like, think okay you guys were enablers and that's what makes you so special however perverse that sounds that's what's so special about the ordinary absolutely absolutely oh how many different directions can we go in uh reminder everyone you can ask questions if you like uh so feel free to put them into the the chat the uh, when it like, I guess, I guess where I go with it is that, okay, so if we, if we say that everyone's enabling and uh, Germans were, Nazis were, of course they were, mid-level managers were in their various different kinds of ways, whether they're shooting guns in Lithuania or whether they're signing orders for, you know, exploiting labor in, in Prague or another province, you know, can we hold them to the same account though as somebody like a Mengele? You know, can we hold them? Is it is you know, or or Auschwitz Commandant Hess? Like, can we actually can can we do that? Are they as bad as, or is it just a case of if you're an enabler and you're enabling a genocide, 
you you are you should just go down with the ship with them i mean what do you think about that i don't know i guess it gets in that's in shades of gray though i mean it's a it's a hard question that's actually one that one of our volunteers asked too <laughs> it, um should we attempt an answer at that um it's a mean one who, who was worse uh, <laughs> Who, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I guess it's 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 maybe a redundant question in some way. I think, I think it's a valid question, maybe less so for the historian and more so for um, the lawyer, because um, there was another question in the chat that I just spotted. Um, um, I'm surprised that Philbert was not executed. He was actually sentenced to life in prison. He only then served 13 years because um, of his deteriorating eyesight. He was actually released in 1975. But he was actually one of the very few um, relatively senior SS officers and frontline Holocaust perpetrators who were sentenced to life imprisonment. Most of them got off with uh, five years or maybe 10 years, yeah? Uh, Philbert was one of the very few who were sentenced to life imprisonment. So obviously lawyers and judges, they have to ask these questions. How heavily does individual guilt weigh? We maybe as historians don't have to do that to the same extent. Um, yeah, in Philbert's case, he really was directly responsible for the deaths of at least 18,000 people. He was the commander of this unit. He, um, he acted, as I've, as I've tried to uh, explain, he, he acted in a, in a very rigorous, radical way. Um, some of his co-defendants at his trial in 1962 accused him of sadism towards some of the Jewish victims. Um, so unlike Josef Mengele, he didn't carry out horrific human experiments on people, but he had 18,000 people on his conscience, 18,000 human beings. Yeah. It's so important, I think, that Alex has been able to mention the post-war, because that's something we haven't really talked about much. And, you know, the fact that when we think about these post-war trials, I mean, there was something like 8 million Nazi party members in 1945, yet something something like 6,000 trials before the late 1950s. You know, a total drop in the ocean. Uh, the post-war must have been a deeply, deeply confusing place for a lot of people in Germany, especially people who were too young to do anything in the 1930s and 40s, people who were wondering what it would have been like and asking their parents and aunts and uncles and whatever about how and why they did certain things. And I think the emergence of these trials, like the one that Alex has, has worked on in the late 1950s, early 1960s, must have been an in incredible turning point in the lives of an entire generation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and confronting the sins of their fathers and trying to figure out what moral code they can possibly follow in that legacy and impact on their lives. Absolutely. One of the questions we have probably our second to last one that we'll ask is a uh, Bass asks, do these men explain their behavior as being rooted in military necessity? Probably for Filbert, I would imagine, or maybe not. Greasing? Uh this, this also relates slightly to another question I just spotted. Did, did Philbert show any remorse? No, he didn't show any remorse. And at his trial, he actually, um, he didn't really refer to military necessity. This was an argument often used. Uh, absolutely, it's a good question. This was an argument often used in post-war trials by Nazi perpetrators. What he did was he just played it down. He just said, yes, well, we did, we did kill about... Yeah, a couple of hundred Jews, but they were plunderers and partisans, and so we had to execute them to show an example. So he just really, really played it down and said that these, these figures that the court had come up with were completely inflated and absolute nonsense and plucked out of thin air. Um, so just generally played it down and, and also played the victim card. This is very, very uh, one of the key tactics of Philbert right to the end of his life. Also, when he's interviewed on set in the 1980s, on this film set, is the victim. His brother died uh, or was in Buchenwald. Yeah, so he's a victim as well, apparently. Mm -hmm. And he really, really did this at the trial, playing the victim card. Yeah, I had to do it. I was forced to say, because of what my brother did, because of this comment he made about Hitler, 
he was then imprisoned and I had to take on the command of this uh, task force and I, and I had to go to the East and fight there. And yes, we killed a few people, but they were partisans, etc. So not so much military necessity, he didn't really emphasize that, but it, it really laid it on thick with the, with the kind of subjective victimhood. Mm, absolutely. Hard to imagine him being actually a victim though, but maybe that was the way for him to justify his actions to himself, right? Because then you got, this, maybe. You, you got the moral, <clears throat> the moral, the moral high ground at that point, I suppose. Yes, thank you, uh, Alex Joseph, for the, the, any more questions? Anyone want to ask one last one of our fabulous speakers this evening? The wheels are turning in my head. I, could, I, could, I wish we were all just sitting around having a beer and some curry burst, having a, a proper good natter in a, a pub somewhere, right? This is, this is the kind of conversation that just could go on and on into the dark hours of the night. Well, pe well, maybe people are still typing. So which, which pub do you usually go to? Where, what can we look forward to when we finally when we finally come and visit in person? Exactly. Hey, well, uh, Huddersfield has many excellent pubs. Thank you. Some dive bars, but some really good pubs as well. Gotta gotta say, definitely you are more, more than welcome when we are finally open open up again. Um, oh, and we have uh, we have a question. What happened to the armchair? <laughs> The armchair is still safely in the apartment in Amsterdam uh, where, and I don't think anything, it's going anywhere anytime soon. They, like I said at the start, that it's really part of their, their life, part of their, you know, objects are so important to so many of us. Um, and I don't think they're gonna part with it anytime soon. The documents <laughs> discovered inside are now with Robert's oldest daughter, Robert Griesinger's oldest daughter, Jutta, at her home. Uh, she she spent uh, the post-war years in Switzerland. She's still alive, living north of Zurich. Amazing, amazing. They didn't think to gift you the chair, hey? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I would put it, but yeah. Uh, although I did, I did see very, very similar chairs when in Prague, when I was interviewing chair makers, going in and out of Atelier. I was able to find, you know, the chair that this book is about is very... It's the sort of chair which today it's like right at the back of all the antique dealers shops because nobody wants it. They're just not fashionable anymore, these chairs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're not the most expensive chairs. If anybody wants them, there are thousands of them in Prague in secondhand shops. Would you want to sit on that chair, Daniel? Can, can fair, would you want to sit on that chair knowing, knowing where it's been, so to speak? Can, can furniture transport guilt? <laughs> it's a good question i remember i spent so long with his documents inside my my uh my sort of coat pocket you know his actual id papers i had all of his papers sort of in my coat for, for ages when i was going around prague um and i remember thinking god what on earth would he make of this his most i mean i haven't even mentioned it today but the documents inside the chair were the most you know, these weren't sort of old bus tickets or, or shopping receipts or anything. These are his most deeply personal papers. Mm. Uh, PhD certificate in law, bonds, stocks and shares that had never been cashed, passports, etc. And I was wondering, God, what would he make of it? Of knowing that me, you know, a Jewish guy from Britain uh, had all of his most treasured papers in, in my pocket all of, the, all of these years later. I don't think he'd be too pleased. No. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So I hope you enjoyed sitting in the chair at least once in my instead. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you, both of you, for your insights, for your outstanding research, for this very inspiring evening. I definitely want to thank you. Um, so uh, we're going to give everyone a round of applause. Yes, as much as we can. Hurrah. Well done. Thank you so much. Alex is going to just say a few words to conclude the, the evening. Um, Alex Joseph, not Alex. Okay. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone. Um, so um, I, I just, if we can, just um, I just want to address a question that was asked at the beginning. Oh, yeah. That um, um, just for Daniel. Um, so Robert's daughters aren't listed on his ID card, and there's the line through the Kinder 
um, bit on his um, passport. And um, I was just wondering whether you could um, ask that, uh, answer that. And, um, yeah, no, I always thought as soon as I got the documents uh, and, and I found them, I, the person from Amsterdam sent me all his documents. So I sort of spread them out over my desk in Florence. And, you know, I, for, for months, I thought I was dealing with somebody who was unmarried and childless because there was no evidence in any of the papers from from Prague that he had ever um, he'd ever had a family. So I got the, a real, the shock of my life when going to Prague, going to local archives, I was able to sort of uncover um, this entire family, which he had hidden from these documents. And of course, I talk about this more in the book, but no, it was definitely somebody, whoever asked that question has excellent um, eyesight to, to spot that on the documents, but definitely um, it, it, it was a surprise. Thank you. Um, I'm just putting the uh, links to both books in the chat again. So if anyone um, hasn't read the books yet and um, is now as as being modelled uh, by Chelsea there, um, if anyone hasn't read the books and is wanting to purchase one, um, then uh, I, I think I think I'll be putting in an order. Uh, I haven't read them yet. Um, so um, yeah, I just want to thank um, both of our speakers uh, this evening. Um, I think uh, I'm really sorry we've uh, run over a little bit of time today. Thank you very much for bearing with us and keeping with us. And uh, I hope you found it very interesting this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alex Kay and Dr. Daniel Lee for generously contributing your time. And uh, thank you also to Chelsea Sandals um, for facilitating the conversation. And, and thank, thank you, you to Alex Joseph for doing fabulous on the technical side. Thank you. Thank you. Huge um, relief. And Thank you. thank you so much for everyone for attending this evening and for and for your questions as well we've got a couple of questions by email ahead of time and some really great engagement in the chat so thank you so much for that um and um as i said at the start i'll be sending out an email with the link to the recording and uh, just a short general online survey i will be putting the survey link where's it gone um in the chat now if you want to do it now it takes literally two minutes um and you're and we appreciate every response. Like I say, it's just a general thing about how you found us. Um, Thanks, Alice. Um, so um, we really love feedback and um, we want these events to be as good as they can be. And speaking of events, um, our next event is in two weeks time. And it ties in with a temporary exhibition that we will have when we reopen in a few months time. Um, so on the Thursday, the 8th of April, um, this event is for the Holocaust and Genocide Research Partnership and we're hosting it. Um, uh, it's with the wonderful Ibi and Trudy speaking about their personal experiences and connections to death marches. And I'm just going to uh, put the link to book that in the chat as well. Uh, so we're offering these online events free of charge. Um, and you can look at our other online events, see if there's anything else that um, that grabs you. Um, we receive no core funding. Um, so if you'd like to give something, then we're really grateful for any amount, however small. Um, and I'm going to put uh, our Just Giving link in the chat as well again. And again, a, a very big thank you to anyone who donated when registering for this uh, for this talk. Uh, don't forget also we're on various social media platforms uh, so please follow us if you aren't already and you can sign up to our newsletters to be the first to hear updates from us and just leaves me to say again thank you so so much um, to our speakers to uh, my co-director um, thank you so much for attending and supporting us um, and I hope you all have a lovely evening and whatever time of day it is for you and I hope to see you at our future events thank you very very much thank you Alex thank you Daniel Pleasure. Thank Thanks for having us. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.